First of all, I'd like to um, thank Mariana. I think not only has she reminded us that the state can be entrepreneurial, which is an extraordinary service she's done with this book and the other work that she, um, that she undertakes at the University of Sussex, but she's also reminded us that um, tenured academics and scholars can be entrepreneurial too. And I think that's, that's a, a nice reminder. We had a gorgeous event yesterday at the House of Commons. This venue, the RSA, is perfect. I don't know whether you saw coming up the stairs the past chairman of this uh, august body, but they, they include Louis Pasteur, Alexander Graham Bell, Ernest Rutherford, extraordinary names from the history of science and invention, not just in innovation. Um, but I'm the Financial Times columnist based in Washington, D.C., so I'm particularly in these very gridlocked times um, in terms of American politics. I'm particularly grateful to be reminded that not only do I live a few miles from Capitol Hill, which is kind of the symbol of um, the paralysis in American decision-making, but I also live a few miles from DARPA and from the National Institutes of Health, which are arguably two of the most innovative and inventive bodies in human history. And I think, as Bill um, will attest, neither DARPA nor the NIH have conducted um, share buybacks uh, in their history as, as, as entities. They are genuinely innovative, and it's great as a Washingtonian um, to be reminded of that. Now, the first panel um, was, was about the public sector agencies. The second is about the private sector. We're used to thinking uh, of the, um, uh, the, the role of um, the public sector, as the private sector, as essentially being, in the last two or three decades, parasitic um, on the great inventions that have come from the DARPAs and the NIHs and the National Science Foundations of this world. Um, but, of course, the history of innovation is, is more properly been one of symbiosis. Um, if you think of Bell Labs, um, AT&T's um, outfit, um, this was uh, as innovative um, and as productive of transform transformational patents as DARPA, arguably, as was Xerox Park. Um, and I'm reminded of a, a press release I saw in 2009, 2010, thereabouts, from Alcatel-Lucent, the now owner of um, Bell Labs, uh, announcing that it was going to close down fundamental research, basic research, because it didn't produce um, a shareholder return. An extraordinary statement if you consider what Bell Labs has done and the returns it's generated for the private sector, for society, and for the taxpayer in the last five, six decades. Um, so the second panel is really about how do we get back that history of symbiosis um, between um, the state as an entrepreneur and the private sector as an entrepreneur. And just as I think Mariana very brilliantly brings out the possibility and the history of the entrepreneurial state in her book, um, by implication, we're now talking about a bureaucratic private sector that doesn't do so much R&D as just D, and that was precisely what the Alcatel-Lucent press release in 2009 on Bell Labs was indicating. Um, so hopefully, we've got, a, we've got a brilliant panel here in terms of um, experts, very rich and diverse um, a bunch of people, um, and diverse... Um, not diverse in the sense that this happens to be all male, but in every other respect, very diverse. I'm glad the previous panel had a bit more balance. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Aaron Mazumdab, who has to go to a very glamorous meeting in Washington that might involve Obama. I, but that might be my journalistic imagination. But anyway, he has to leave. He has a hard stop of 12.35, so Aaron is going to kick us off. Um, Aaron is, I think, ideal person to kick this off in terms of bridging the two panels, um, because not only is he head of Google Energy Research at the moment, um, and Google, of course, is one of the very few exceptions to the Apple-Cisco share buyback um, uh, trends we've been seeing here. Google does invest in research, and it, it doesn't do fantastically large share buybacks. But he was also, before that, um, uh, the, I think the founding director of ARPA-E, and we've heard from Cheryl in the previous panel, um, 
uh, are in, uh, her predecessor, am I right in thinking that the same job? But anyway, it's the same organization. Um, so Aaron, um, why don't you start? We'll, we'll then have Bill, because Aaron has to leave early, Bill is our discussant, um, Bill Lazonic responding to Aaron and posing some questions for the next two panelists who I'll introduce afterwards, but just briefly to introduce um, Bill. Bill's one of the leading scholars um, of the financialization and I guess the short-termism um, in the private sector of the last two, three decades and has written extensively on it. Um, I'm sure that Apple and people have a little effigy of you which they stick pins into um, because you call them out. Um, so Bill's an ideal discussant for this topic and this panel. Um, with that, let's start with Aaron. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you, Mariana, for your flexibility and the timing and uh, adaptability. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I I've been very blessed, number one, in being part of the team at ARPA-E and then being part of a, just an amazing company, which is Google. And what I'd like to do is to share my experience, and I think Cheryl has done a beautiful job in explaining what ARPA-E is all about and how it operates and how it engages with the stakeholders, et cetera. But the fundamental core, so I will complement that a little bit by talking about the core function of ARPA-E, which is the research. And I'd like to put that in historical context as to you know, what, how has innovation happened uh, over the last couple of centuries, frankly, and how should we think about it? And perhaps draw some lessons from that moving forward. Number one, um, the last 250 years has been perhaps one of the most remarkable periods in human history because, uh, you know, I, we call it out, Steve Chu and I wrote a paper which appeared in Nature. We called out this thing as going from horsepower, horsepower to horsepower. So this is what happened. We, we, were, we used to travel like that, and we used to light our homes like this, and now we do this. And this is, you know, in the whole, we talked about a little bit of history yesterday, but the last 250 years is a blink um, in the human history, and that blink was the Industrial Revolution which started here. So if you look at this, this last 250 years and all the lessons learned from how innovation happens, and it all goes back to you know, the origins of that, the science and the engineering and the technology in, in context with the finance and the policy and the whole ecosystem that creates around it. So number one lesson that we learn is that basic and applied research cannot be separated. The common myth is that there's basic research, then it hands over to applied research, then it hands over to you know, technology and innovation and all that. That's bull. Let me give you an example of that. This is going back to, this is the first steam engine of 1712, the new common steam engine, before the James Watt engine, but it was extremely inefficient. It was less than 1% efficiency. And then Watt and Bolton, Bolton was the business. So here, again, technology, engineer, and business coming together, came up with a steam engine in the 1770s, which was much more efficient because of a new design element that they introduced. When they designed these engines, they had no idea about the science behind it. The first and second laws of thermodynamics, which really lay the foundation for what the efficiency ought to be, were created 100 years later. And these laws of nature, which are the first, these are, by the way, much more fundamental in many ways than Newton's laws of physics. These lay the foundation not only for this, but lay the foundation for biology, for chemistry, and everything else. So this came much later. So in this case, technology and applied research led to basic science. It's not always the other way around. It's really a feedback loop between the two. Lesson number two, uh, research, basic and applied research, takes time to mature. And it's not always predictable where it goes. Let me give you just sort of run down one of the most innovative things that have happened over the last 40 years, which is what we often call the internet. How did it start? When did it start? Well, it started in 1968. The first DARPA funding for ARPANET was in 1968. The first demonstration of networking between four universities 
was in 1969. This is the first paper by Vince Cerf and Robert Kahn, Bob Kahn, on TCP IP, which was in 1974, which we all use today. And then the first ARPANET was fully operational without the TCP IP in 1975, and it took nine years for TCP IP to be implemented on ARPANET, and it became the protocol that we use, all use today. And that was not enough, because it took legislation. This is where, you know, people, Al Gore claimed that he invented the internet. Well, he actually did. <laughs> he had a major role to play. And that was the legislation of High Performance Computer and Communication Act, which opened up the ARPANET between other nets, and which all got together as various subnets into what is called the internet. So it took 23 years from the basic science of networking to actual impact in society. And that also, now we're still looking at the implications of the internet in various things. So that is, it takes time to mature, and it doesn't happen over two or three or five years. And this persistent of funding is very, very important for basic science and engineering that needs to happen for innovation. Number one, technological progress is not a straight line. It goes in very unpredictable ways. Let me give you an example. This is the first transistor that was made of germanium that was invented by Bratton and Bardeen, both of whom got the Nobel Prize later on. And this was what is called a point contact transistor made of germanium. The integrated circuit, which we all know about, came about in 1958 and 59 by Kilby and Noyce. Kilby made out of germanium, Noyce made out of silicon, and Noyce went on to create Intel and other, you know, and, and, uh, Intel and Fairchild, etc. It took 11 years to go from that point contact transistor to the integrated circuit. And look what the shape of the integrated circuit is. You want, you're not going to use that today. And nowadays, we use that. About billions of transistors in there. So you look at the time scale, and you look at where it went. There are lots of failures. There are lots of you know, skeletons out there. And, and those were, again, opportunities to learn. because. When you go in this direction, there are a lot of blind alleys, which you don't know. But you've got to go there and find out, and then come back again and figure out a pathway. And of course, that is what is called the Moore's Law today. So it took a long time. There are many, many different twists and turns in this process. Secondly, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, failure is important, but fail and learn quickly. It, we don't call it failures. In our opinion, I don't think we call it failure. It's opportunities to learn, but let's do that quickly. Let's not waste time, and let's go back to the drawing board again. And I'm not going to spend too much time. All of these cases that I talked about, in every innovation, there's failure. And I'll just leave Michael Jordan's quote out here for a little while. And in fact, he, wouldn't, he, he calls himself the biggest failure, and he was the most successful basketball player of all times. So when you break down technologies, there are two kinds of technologies or techno-economic learning curves that one can, uh, can see. Number one is existing learning curve. When the transistor win was invented, there was no learning curve of integrated circuits. But that got created after several decades of R&D. But once there is a learning curve, which is the Moore's Law, it going from 1999 to 2011, it gets smaller and smaller. There's a lot of research that is needed to, to enable that to happen. And this is, you can, you can call it basic research, some of it is basic, some of it is applied. Those are all words, but research is needed to go down this learning curve. And that research needs, needs to continuously improve the technology and compete in the market. If Intel had not done it, AMD would have done it, or some other companies would have done it. So who should pay for it? Clearly, if, the, if this affects the bottom line, certainly the industry has to pay a large fraction of it, and that's what they do. Not that the government does not invest. There are some national security reasons that DARPA is investing in these kinds of things as well uh, and creating the fundamental tools to enable this to happen. But there's a public-private partnership, but the industry has to bear a substantial amount of the cost of doing that research. But this is one kind of R&D that needs to happen on incremental improvement, extremely important because it leads to economic growth. But then is the question of what happens when you don't have a learning curve. And that's where the disruptive and the transformational part comes. And let me sort of explain that using the example of transportation. 
in the early 1900s or late 1800s, that was the mode of transportation, and that was the existing learning curve. And I put that in the, in, in the axis of cost and performance and time and scale. In the energy business, for example, if something does not scale and something does not come down in cost, it doesn't matter. So let's take this as an example. And at that time, in the late 1800s, if someone were to improve the wheel and get a better bearing and make it more, make a faster, you know, uh, horse carriage, that's great. That's incremental improvement. And that's what I talked about in the Intel case, in the, in the Moore's Law case. That's incremental improvement. So, someone has to do that. But what about the entirely new learning curves that were created early enough in the late you know, 1800s? There were lots of shots at goal. And at that time, the automated car, the vehicle, was considered a transformative solution. But, and there were many of them that failed. Again, those were opportunities to learn. Those were the little circles out there. It didn't go any, you know, any farther than that because it just didn't pan out. But one of them did, that's a Model T. And that became disruptive because it just became cheaper and cleaner. And so this is the case where if you are in the early stage, which is where ARPA E is, ARPA E is looking at creating new learning curves, not going down incrementally down existing learning curves, but creating new learning curves. In that case, there is no market. And so in those cases, it is extremely important for, for ARPA E to create the environment for this research to be done and the private sector to come in later on if it shows signs of success. So the engagement with the private sector that Cheryl talked about, extremely important to engage the stakeholder to make sure that if it is successful, that this has a place to go. But someone has to step in early and talk about this research. Now this is, now I'll, I'll say a little bit about, you know, from all my scars of battling, of budget battles in Washington that Cheryl is now going through right nowadays. You know, so the question is, how do we fund this? Clearly, the public sector has to be involved in this. But if, if I look at what this means in terms of the time scale, we are talking about a long time scale because it takes, as I said, 20 years for it to develop. And the annual budget time scales are fluctuating given the political sides of you know, who, how much should be put. And we went through all kinds of oscillations uh, in our budget proposals. Eventually, the budget turned out to be fine. And this is where I think if you really want, this is so fundamental, the innovation is so fundamental to the nation's economic growth in the future, that you almost want to secure that future in some way. And we have thought about this a lot. There are lots of valleys of death. This is not just one valley. There are lots of valleys of death. And I really think there's a role for not just the investment from the government side, but some kind of a public private endowment for mission-oriented, mission-driven, basic and applied research to create this fundamentally new disruptive, transformative and disruptive technology learning curves. I'll stop out here and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Bill, what, Bill why didn't you um, respond to that and pose questions to the others? Okay, so, um, my slides up there. I'm going out of order. I hope I won't be, be out of order, but I'm going out of order because uh, Aaron has to leave. And uh, one of the uh, questions I have is the uh, uh, is an issue of uh, Google's role in all this, Google as a company, because I think it's actually one of the most important companies right now in the world. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, uh, a semantic question, but it has a deeper meaning. I, I don't like public versus private. Uh, many of the most fantastic companies that I've studied uh, in history have been state-owned. Uh, but more than that, uh, publicly owned companies in the United States are what we might call publicly listed companies. Uh, shareholders play absolutely no role in those companies. Uh, they separated ownership and control because the old owner entrepreneurs wanted to get out of those companies. Salaried managers run those companies. That's been true for over 100 years. So read Alfred Chandler's book. The managerial revolution, visible hand managerial revolution in American business, it ends in 1920. Uh, so uh, we need to talk, and, and part of the problem is that private feeds into uh, the notion of neoclassical economics, private decision makers, and the public coming in. We need to understand what business and government do and what their different functions are and how they relate to one another. Now, in terms of the uh, two papers, the two uh, pr presentations that are coming after, I actually have less to say and more to learn. 
but the question I have in the case of what you'll hear is of Graham uh, Bio, a family-owned company in Brazil making biofuels. Uh, we heard some of it actually answer this question in the first session about from, from uh, the government's point of view, from BNDS, uh, what their principles are in terms of funding companies, but I want to hear from companies what their principles are in going to, to the government. Not necessarily the particular details of this uh, deal, but what are the principles? And that's actually a discussion I know in the United States we do not have. Uh, we do have it, it's all shareholder value and that's all what it's about and, and government agencies accept that, so that's part of the problem. It's a non-discussion, but I wanna hear what that discussion is in Brazil. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover raises another uh, set of issues, and that's because this is uh, two of the most famous car marks in, in British history. Uh, they were owned, well, uh, I guess Land Rover briefly was owned by BMW, a German company, uh, both owned by Ford, now owned by an Indian company. Uh, and you're asking the government to uh, supply uh, resources to support uh, innovation in this company. We, this is a global economy. How do, we, how do we deal with this issue? So it raises a whole different set of issues. Okay, Google. Now, uh, actually, I took these uh, uh, snippets, I hope you don't mind, Aaron, from, from the thing you sent around. Uh, but bas basically, uh, the, this, uh, the question that was raised in some notes that were sent around to, to us were uh, that uh, there's a real need for transformative research uh, uh, in high-tech industry, in any high-tech industry. And from the point of view of Google, I guess, in this case, uh, it, it needs to be there. It hasn't, the need for it hasn't disappeared. As we just heard, it was there in the past. Google is certainly a beneficiary of this, as are Intel, uh, Microsoft, and a whole host of other companies. And so now that those companies are making lots and lots of money, and as we'll see, giving lots, almost all that money to their shareholders, Google's an exception, the question is who's gonna invest in the knowledge base? And I didn't hear in the panel before uh, which was talking from the government point of view, uh, how that issue is being addressed. In fact, I think uh, probably too much of uh, what's coming out of business in the United States may be accepted there. Now this is uh, actually a very important book if you wanna read a book on the decline of corporate research labs. It's from a, uh, a conference that I was at in 1993 at Harvard Business School. Uh, came out in 1996, Gordon Moore was there, and this is a, a quote from a paper that's in that book where basically he says that uh, you don't have startups without the large corporations. Lose the large corporation uh, companies or research organizations, large companies and startups disappear. We've actually lost them. <laughs> uh, the startups haven't disappeared because there's still all that legacy there that they can build on. So Facebook can, can build Facebook on the internet uh, structure that it did not create and it created very little value uh, in terms of actual technological innovation uh, relative to what had gone on before. Okay, now let me just briefly uh, uh, say something about what happened to corporate R&D in the United States. It actually declined very precipitously uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, I've written a paper with a former engineer from Lucent on the rise and demise of Lucent technology. I know what happened to Bell Labs. Uh, it lasted a bit longer. But basically three things happened uh, in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there was a move to open systems. Uh, where you could innovate on the basis of an open system, you had access to technology. IBM made that transition. IBM went from being what I call the old economy, a new economy company from proprietary technologies to open systems and changed its whole business model as a result. There's a book I've written where you can read about this. Uh, what happened then uh, uh, at the same time was because so much of these startups were coming online and they were being backed by venture capital, what, uh, what uh, Moore was talking about, uh, people started leaving. Uh, the research organizations going to startups. They're attracted not by secure employment, which they had at the startups and being able to do all this creative work, but they're attracted by stock options. Uh, not right at the top, but right down through the, through the organization. And if they got lucky, uh, they could actually make a lot of money in a very short period of time. I'll give you lots of stories of that. Okay, and that really disrupted the organizational structure of, uh, of, of, of these learning organizations. It's still true today. Any learning organization where people are constantly leaving is not gonna be able to innovate. Uh, and then the third thing, which I think is the most fundamental thing, was going on around the same time, and I saw it happen at Harvard Business School when I was there in the 1980s. They hired Michael Jensen, the finance professor in 1985. I was there, I said, this is the end of uh, America as we know it in terms of investment in technology, building organizations, Chandler's managerial revolution. Top executives imbibed the ideology that companies should be run to maximize shareholder value. Now you might know this guy, uh, he uh, 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 
took GA, GE from a big conglomerate into a more focused, most, more focused company, uh, made most of its money out of GE Capital, and wrote this book when he retired after 20 years, uh, Jack Straight from the Gut. But he didn't say everything in the book because it took the financial, revolution, uh, financial crisis for him to basically say that shareholder value is a dumb idea. And this was from a, uh, uh, an interview in the uh, Financial Times. It's, uh, as far as I know, it was never videoed. And I think uh, after he made this statement, the, the uh, uh, reporter must have looked shocked. And he then made the statement again. It's a dumb idea. The idea of shareholder value as a strategy is insane. It's a product of your combined efforts from the management to the employees. And I think what he says here is correct, except it hasn't been applied. OK, now, very, very briefly, uh, I've, uh, shareholder value theory has no fundamental logic in reality uh, because it basically argues that there's only one group of people in the economy who take risks, public shareholders. And in fact, they take the least risk of all. They just buy and sell shares and can sell them very easily whenever they want. The people who take risks are any worker you employ, you or me or anybody else. We work today, we put in a lot of effort, extra effort, we get paid, but we want a career. And we're looking to get some of the gains of innovation in the future. Uh, we have a career, as people used to have in, in U.S. companies. We get the returns. Uh, we get laid off, mass layoffs. Someone's take, eating our lunch. Uh, taxpayers, well, we've been talking about that. Taxpayers are, are funding uh, innovation. We expect to get a return. Yes, we have a tax system that sometimes, in fact, as Mariana mentioned, and back in the uh, uh, period up until the real, right up to through the 1970s, you could say that the taxpayer in the United States was getting a return for the investment made in infrastructure, knowledge base, a whole bunch of things. Uh, that has not been true since that time because, in fact, uh, the business side of it has said, no, we do all the innovation, uh, government does nothing. Now, here's uh, 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 an, an example. Well, first of all, the way in which this has been manifested is by massive distributions of uh, the company's cash to, to shareholders uh, and the uh, rewarding of top executives uh, for doing this. And I won't go into this. I'll talk about this a bit tomorrow. But basically, most of the pay of top executives is stock-based. And it's very short term. They can make a lot of money. When the stock price goes down, goes up, goes down, they make money. Uh, they're pumping the money out into the so-called uh, private sector uh, to shareholders. Uh, these are the top 10 repurchasers uh, in uh, uh, the period 2003-2012. Uh, you can see more than 100% of their income has gone to dividends and stock buybacks, mainly the stock buybacks. The S&P 500, it's about 54% over this decade, 2003-2012, uh, to, to buybacks, another 37% to dividends. Very little is left in, to invest in the future, to uh, reward employees, and in fact, a lot of that money is made free, what the agency theorists, theorists call the free cash flow, by laying off people. Google right now is an exception. Okay? It hasn't done any uh, buybacks. It pays uh, no dividends. Uh, here's the uh, NIH. It's the biggest uh, program now uh, in the United States uh, for funding industry. You do not have a medical science industry without the NIH. Um, here is the way uh, the business side looks at it in the United States. This is from a Ernst & Young, uh, uh, a graphic from a, an annual publication on the biotech industry where they talk about, as you can see, heavy regulation. And there's the NIH right in there. So $30 billion a year is heavy regulation of the industry. This is the ideology. Okay? And then there's other things like the Orphan Drug Act, which is fundamental to the growth of the in industry from 1983, never mentioned. And it's actually a conspiracy of silence. If you read the literature on the biotech industry, the pharmaceutical industry, they do not talk about the NIH. Okay? They do not talk about government funding because it's all theirs. Okay? One of the manifestations of this is that companies that benefit from uh, this spending uh, are just propping up their stock prices and charging consumers in the United States, uh, basically people uh, who need drugs, uh, twice what they do in Britain. We know that from the, because the Britain put out a schedule, British put out a schedule every year, uh, and uh, use that extra profits uh, from uh, higher drug prices just to prop up their stock prices. We find other examples of basically hypocrisy. Uh, so you have uh, uh, companies like Intel lobby the government for more spending on nanotechnology uh, research, and then, as I point out here, uh, Intel itself, one company has spent through buybacks four times the whole nanotechnology initiative budget from its inception to through 2013. 
Another example, alternative energy, ExxonMobil, which buys back about $20 billion per year in stock, gets about $600 million per year in tax breaks. Uh, and then you have companies like this. They self-styled uh, American Energy Innovation Council. They lobby the government to triple spending on energy research, yet th these two companies alone, their combined buybacks uh, over, uh, 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 per year are about the amount that they're asking the government to spend. So why don't they step up to the plate? Uh, very quickly, IBM is one of the worst offenders. IBM now has this crazy uh, strategy. This is IBM's strategy laid out in 2011 to hit $20 earnings per share by, 19, by 2015. It's about $14 uh, per share right now, so it's now nowhere close. So it's massively laying off people. It's massively doing buybacks, even though it's done that all along, even as it's, as it's profitable. Uh, Microsoft, why doesn't Microsoft innovate? Uh, because people at the top have been willing to take Microsoft's money. They still have plenty of m money left, but they will only take billions, up to 10 billion, 12 billion a year, and just give it to people who don't matter to prop up their stock price. And so I think Steve Ballmer was a bad C CEO, because I think anybody who starts thinking that way, starts saying that we're going to give away all this money to people who don't matter to the company, are not going to be able to have a vision of the future. Okay, so let me get to Google, and this is uh, uh, where I want to... Uh, Leave it, this is actually my last slide, and this is the question, can Google be different? Uh, Google has, it's a very young company, and for a young company, been exceptionally innovative. And it has also exceptional influence uh, around the world on, on our ability to do things. And uh, so we have a lot at stake on what Google does. But that, what we have at stake is in the hands of two people. Because Google set up a uh, dual uh, share structure, uh, which uh, actually became a treble share structure in, in April because the Class A shares were diluting the, uh, the ownerships, uh, the voting stake of Page and, and Brin and, and uh, Schmidt and Dorr. Uh, and uh, so what goes on in the future depends on these two people or these four people. And uh, they may decide to keep investing in innovation. Uh, they may decide to do massive buybacks. But what I would like them to do in addition, and I doubt whether they'll do this, but they could surprise me and, and do it, is step up to the plate as industry leaders and say this is what the United States should be doing in terms of the principles in which companies deal with their profits, with their employees, uh, with shareholders, uh, with government, and change the, the nature of the discussion in the United States. I, uh, there was a prospect that this could happen with Apple. That disappeared as Apple now has promised to do $90 billion in buybacks in the next, uh, 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 well, now a year and a half and two and a half years, and is totally in the pocket of hedge funds. Uh, but maybe Google will be different. So I want to end it there. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I think that's as good as a quick presentation ever gets. That was really, really stimulative. Thank you. And Aaron, you have the question. You're in the hot seat. Um, is Google different? Um, and is it going to be different? What do you know about Page and Bryn and Schmidt? There's a very famous saying by American philosopher um, Yogi Berra. That is, yeah. you know, it's very hard to predict, especially the future. Um, First of all, I, I would just say that I think Google is blessed by having uh, Page and Bryn uh, in the lead because, at least in my interactions with them, they are thinking long term. Uh, there's, in fact, if someone goes with a short term thing to, to Larry, and he basically just ignores. In fact, he's thinking more of the long term than many of the day-to-day -day things, which I think he should. Um, and in that respect, I think it, it, it bodes well. And some of the things that they have done, that Google has done, whether it is self-driving cars or many other things. In fact, in my own interaction with him, the way it started, I probably would not have joined Google unless I'd interacted with Larry. And in that interaction, it was a two and a half hour brainstorming, just he and I of what we should do about the grid, of the electricity grid, and can we start from scratch and not go back to the Tesla Edison grid, but rather start from scratch and create something which is 21st century. We have networking, we have computing, 
power electronics all integrated in the right way. That's the smart grid. That should be the smart grid, as opposed to taking today's grid and trying to make it smarter. So those were the discussion, and if I look at where the investments are going, these are big bets that are going you know, mostly for creating new technologies in the future uh, in the long term, because that, they believe, is, is the way to survive in the long term. Because it's done extremely well so far, and it has, you know, um, it's created shareholder value. But it's extremely done, it treated the employees extremely well, and it's ranked the, num the number one company to work for three years in a row. So, uh, but I think it all goes back to the top. And um, there, is, there is a goal, there's at least a vision in trying to go long term. And trying, and if you're trying, you're not trying hard enough, it's actually looked down upon. Can, can I cut in with a question? If, if uh, as Bill says, Google is sort of almost unique in having the potential to be a kind of 21st century Bell Labs, what is it about Google, in addition to, to Page and Brin's um, characters and, and, and vision that makes Google unique in that respect? Is it, is it that they don't have to respond to shareholders? They do have 55% of voting shares. Is that the key sort of difference with Apple? I, I can't or talk what? about that because, frankly, I don't know enough about the, uh, you know, what happens in the board meetings, et cetera. That's above my pay grade. Let me just put it uh, bluntly. Um, but I can tell you what the culture is inside Google and what is favored. Just to give you an idea, you know, like in most companies, at least in Google, we have quarterly goals. These are called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. And at the end of the quarter, you're, you have to rank yourself or your team as to, you know, whether you got a one or you got a zero or somewhere in between. One means you've achieved your goals. If the team is ranked one, it's actually frowned upon because you're not trying hard enough. Of course, if you're getting zeros, that's pretty bad. So, but the idea is that you gotta try, you gotta have a stretch goal because if you're not, then you, you're, not, you're not pushing yourself harder and especially when you're thinking about the long term. I know you've gotta go in five minutes, so I'm gonna be again a little unorthodox, innovative, um, and give Bill a quick question because um, I suspect you have better ones than me. Give him, give him, give him hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think I think the nice send off. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think nice I think possible, Dan, Danny Bresnett's right? comment about you know the industries are different, and uh, if, you know if you're talking about building the smart grid and building the whole infrastructure for electric cars and you know. Uh, you're not just talking about Google, obviously. And so, sure. you know, I can see why you're talking about transformative research. So, so the, the issue is, uh, what is, okay, I'm a taxpayer in the United States. Uh, uh, what is Google going to give back to me for using my taxes to fund uh, the development of this infrastructure? Uh, given that we have a tax system which has gone the way it has, particularly. Uh, now, if, you see, and, and here, let me just say that this is not about Google alone, obviously. This is about leadership about in changing the system. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, the, so how, how can a company like Google uh, show leadership in this in saying, okay, not only are we doing this, but this is not just about us. This is not just about us making more money. Uh, we are in a position where we can take this leadership position. We're doing fine. <laughs> Our, uh, we're treating our employees well, and by the way, I think we have a long history that companies that treat their employees well are companies that are innovative, and that's how we raise standard of living in, in the economy. So it's, it's not by supply and demand in the labor market, it's by companies. You're going to turn this into yeah. a question. Yeah, and so, I, so, so how can Google interface with the society to, to, to make this happen? Because it can't happen with Google alone. Well, there are there's several answers to this. Number one, it has what is called Google.org, which is a philanthropic organization which has crisis management. And for example, in, in Hurricane Sandy, um, from what I understand, the Department of Energy actually used the Google knowledge of crisis management, this particular team, that helped in identifying which gasoline stations had electricity but no gasoline and which ones had gasoline but no electricity because the response of the government is very different 
and they actually use that. So this is cri So anywhere in the world, if there's crisis, these guys go and figure out. If there's any election going on around the world, they go and report what's going on and actually help uh, connect people. Um, so those are a few things. There's a philanthropic aspect to it. There are competitions. There are grants that are given out. Um, but uh, let me just bring it to context of this meeting in terms of innovation. Um, and I'll give you an example which sort of answers your question. ARP, and it relates to ARPA-E. When I was in ARPA-E, we created a whole program on a disruptive technology on power electronics. All power electronics today is made of silicon, and we felt that if you use silicon carbide or gallium nitride, different materials, you could, be, you could make it cheaper and better. And this, that would be disruptive in the marketplace. And, and so that program ended um, this year, I believe, right? This year. So yesterday, Google announced something called the Little Box Challenge. And this is a prize, a million dollars, that it'll just give away to, the whole, to anyone who, um, who gets to this goal of making a solar inverter. I won't go into the details of this, which is extremely small, about almost 100 times smaller. So the, the whole solar two kilowatt inverter will fit in the, into an iPad, which is, or I should say Nexus 10, <laughs> <laughs> which is as thin. So, so the, the reason I'm saying this is the idea that it's, it's, the idea is not to get IP out of these people, but to catalyze the industry to take it beyond the government investment so that we can catalyze the whole ecosystem so that not just Google, but everyone else benefits from it as well. So this is an example of how it is thinking about it. Um, Aaron, I know you have to go. Thank you very much. We've um, uh, learned a lot from that. And slightly hogged the time for our other two panelists. So Sorry, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, now we've heard from uh, Western companies and Western governments and indeed Western uh, uh, developing public sector bodies, including our sponsor, the Brazil Development, Brazilian Development Bank. But Fernando Gradin is um, uh, a very welcome um, example of uh, a developing country entrepreneur who's uh, benefiting from um, a stake, I believe 15% stake, is that correct, of BNDES. And so we'd love to hear about how, how all this looks from your perspective. Thank you, Edward, uh, Mariana, and John Jess. Thank you again for, for the invitation. Um, allow me to, to tell you a little bit of my bias and where I come from. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, so I tend to see risk probably different from most people that I've talked uh, so far. And of course, I have limits on the big academic concept on how this is inserted. So uh, allow me to give you maybe a limited view, but a practical view on how I see risk taking <coughs> in Brazil and the environment in Brazil and how this uh, public pa pa uh, private uh, partnership with BNDS has showed, um, I think, very successful and uh, in a very successful case. Uh, I'll try to answer some of the questions that uh, were given to us along the presentation. But basically, um, I'd like to start uh, talking a little bit about uh, what's happening in the innovation environment in Brazil. Brazil is a country of a deep contrasts, and we go from education, so we have still very poor education at the fundamental level. But on the other hand, there's an elite coming from schools, specifically on basic research, that's really transforming with much magic how the Brazilian science is coming closer to technology. And that has been happening for the last eight years in a very incredible pace, measured by um, publishing papers and the number of people that are coming from schools and starting up companies. Uh, there's a huge challenge in Brazil uh, to grow and curb misery and bring people from very deep poverty into middle class. And that also uh, gives a lot of debate in our country on how much this money is actually spent on just uh, infrastructure and growth, but also taking responsibility of, of, of bringing very poor people to um, a dignified standard of living. Brazil still has a very protected market for some industries, and that's bad, because this uh, inhibits innovation by giving some comfort of protecting threats instead of protecting or uh, uh, investing in productivity and embracing the new. And uh, unfortunately, we still have some uh, wrong incentives or wrong uh, intervention 
on uh, some of the sectors like electrical sector and the oil sector. They can also inhibit some value chains, some innovations in a few fields. However, how to avoid economic stagnation and stimulate innovation is basically to try to build a new environment and to change and shift the, the mind model in which uh, private sector and public sector can interact. And something really phenomenal is happening in Brazil and has happened for the last years. In the last four years, the total of private and public investment in R&D has quadrupled in Brazil. And we see that through many um, uh, fields of action and many um, direct investment from public and, and private sectors. The Science and Technology Ministry has developed the national labs. Petrobras has invested in the value chain and invest heavily in the value chain for the pre-salt, um, attracting companies like GE and IBM to put national or international labs in, in Brazil. And we also think that a new framework has been set up. In our case, the, the new fr uh, framework in, in, in biotech industry to protect IP and access genetic assets, something that was not debated three years ago, is now coming to a very modern framework so that it enables the industry to innovate and grow. There's uh, a number of uh, very powerful funding instruments through BNDS and FINEP. I'm sure that uh, BNDS will tell you more uh, later. But uh, with a very clear background uh, on innovation mind model uh, building. And uh, if we can do that by modernizing the science infrastructure and creating this new model, we will have companies like ours coming. Our company was funded uh, just uh, three years ago. We are very young. And we are looking for something to be transformational. And our main goal was uh, to build a transformation and innovation system within our company that would enable renewables-based advanced economy and creating the very cleanest industry ever, taking advantage of the abundance of biomass in Brazil and what uh, the genetic revolution can also bring on synthetic biology. So um, we exist so, so that uh, we can aspire uh, a entire value chain, but basically provide a solution uh, on bioenergy, biochemicals, and biofuels in a nutshell, making the cellulosic sugar the new crude. So we are really trying to build a new industry from residual biomass and dedicated energy crops and with a dream that this carbon coming from cellulosic sugars can face and challenge the oil industry all along. And in order to do so, there is, uh, of course, a um, bold challenge in what uh, innovation we have to materialize so that it happens. Um, and uh, when we started thinking on how we would uh, uh, enable this and how soon, at the same year, BNDS was launching a program, not for the whole um, um, realm that we want to be, but specifically for uh, uh, sugar and ethanol, and it was called the PAIS program. That was a specific program to bring innovation to the uh, sugar in, in, and ethanol industry in Brazil, which was facing, or is facing, uh, a great financial challenge and structuring challenge uh, on the fuel prices and all the value chain. The PAIS program, invited a number of uh, companies, I think 37 companies actually um, were uh, subscribed and that got um, uh, some kind of uh, support from BNDS. If I'm not wrong, the total amount was about $2 billion uh, in loans and, and, and guarantees. And after one year, we, sub we also submitted it, uh, after one year, uh, BNDS financed our first second generation ethanol plant, which is the first of a kind in the South Hemisphere. We uh, have been commissioning it for the, for the last two weeks, so we expect to produce second-generation ethanol for the first time in the South Hemisphere next week or the week after. Uh, and after some time, after one year, basically, uh, another part of BNDS, it's called the Entrepreneurial Capital section of BNDS, came to us and said, why uh, would you consider us investing in the company certain, with certain rules? Uh, would have to protect a minimum return, you'd have to go public or give liquidity for us later, and uh, you'd have to accept some of our compliance and governance so that we can accelerate your business plan because we have a common mission. BNDS has a mission of transforming and innovating the sugar uh, and ethanol uh, sector in Brazil, and you have a mission with, uh, within your company 
to uh, transform a cellulosic sugar in a new carbon source that would compete with oil. So there was this uh, great synergy in concept, but basically in the mission. And uh, we negotiated for some time, and BNDS uh, invested $200 million in, in our company. Grand Bio is a, is a family-owned company, and BNDS invested $200 million for 15% uh, of, of the company. In addition to that, BNDS supports FINEPI, which is an innovation agency in Brazil, to also uh, on very much uh, disruptive uh, initiatives, this one in genetics and in the new crop. So in less than three years, we could bring a plan that was in a napkin. This is the actual napkin. Uh, that would uh, kind of bring the entire value chain from the raw material or the biomass under $20 per ton to final clients like Coke, Nike, that would value at the same cost competitive of oil base material, sugar base material that would not compete with food or not threat the forest, the Amazon forest or, or the, the uh, food crops in Brazil. And in three years, we came from the napkin to actual execution. All these pictures are actual pictures of uh, Grand Bio first collecting the straw uh, and uh, bringing the straw and transforming the straw through the first second generation ethanol plant in uh, ethanol. We uh, were certified recently uh, this ethanol will be the cleanest ethanol, the cleanest fuel in the world with um, uh, intensive carbon lower than seven um, dioxide carbon per gel. This is the largest pile of uh, renewable biomass uh, cane straw in the world, according to KBR. This is a uh, 180,000 ton uh, of um, uh, biomass that will be converted into uh, ethanol as a proof of concept, and later on with uh, synthetic biology, this sugar will also be transformed into some uh, biochemical molecules, nanocellulose to be applied in advanced materials, and eventually in amino acids. We also developed a, a different breed of cane. For 30 years, Brazil has developed cane so that uh, it would have more sugar per individual. That was part of the ethanol program. And it was kind of a program that was well taken uh, th 30 years ago and conducted so that to have more productivity in the field and produce the, the cheapest ethanol, most competitive ethanol in the world. We uh, approached these um, uh, innovation in agencies uh, in Brazil, universities and others, and we proposed to do a different pathway. Instead of looking for the cane that will have more sugar per individual, as we were looking for canes that will have more biomass per individual, will come back from the natural evolution path of those uh, 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 ancestors and try to go from what they had as research and through the alliances with universities and the national institutes, we started investing in what would be the uh, cellulosic biomass impact. So we decided, we developed what's called energy cane. This is a, a, a comparison between the sugar cane, rich in sugar, and the energy cane, rich in biomass in the same region, suffering a drought. So the amount of biomass the energy cane can generate is three times more, maybe four, than what sugar cane can develop. And another uh, alliance with BNDS is that, well, if you have a program that can also develop areas that we have like uh, scattering cattle, uh, and you can build uh, um, uh, clusters that will develop another economic um, birth uh, for these regions, like the green ones that you see, semi-arid regions, we can also finance that. So um, three years ago, we had a plan, as I showed. Um, uh, this is the plant that's built. This is a January 14th picture. And this is uh, the uh, today picture. You see the smoke. It's already producing. And um, um, so last um, um, remarks, we've been, um, since uh, we founded uh, the company, we also acquired other companies. We have an R&D in the US. We have been able to create uh, uh, 610 direct jobs a number of indirect jobs. We have 77 researchers, out of which uh, 31 are PhDs, dedicated researchers. We uh, uh, have more than 125 uh, patents, and we started producing the cleanest sugar uh, so far. My final slide, if I may. Uh, I think that uh, the way government can elaborate uh, a mission-oriented program and have uh, reducing the conflict agency between public and private is make sure that you stimulate entrepreneurship and, if possible, small companies. Build smart demand for the fittest and fastest. I think like the US did, the RFS, uh, other countries can do and have a transnational kind of uh, alliance on how 
you know, solid demand can um, stimulate entrepreneurs to innovate and reach that uh, uh, first. And uh, I believe uh, it's better if uh, private sector leads, but it's a biased view. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo. Um, last, last but not least, and I hope um, brief, um, although you, th th that's really unfair of me because of you're going last, um, is Tony Harper. Those of you who aren't from Britain might not be aware of the Wimbledon effect, but I often think of the Wimbledon effect when I think of the British car industry because like, like Tony's companies, Jaguar and Land Rover, they're all owned by foreign companies and yet there is more production of cars here than ever before, a bit like Wimbledon. Um, we never win Wimbledon, which actually we do um, nowadays. Starting, we never win Wimbledon, starting. but we host it. Anyway, Tony, talk, talk to us about uh, innovation in the British car industry. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and for a, for a change of, uh, I guess, a, ch a shift of gear here, it, this is the view from the corporate salaried research chief. Um, uh, and how all this looks from, uh, from, 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 our, from our company. So first of all, what's our, what's our mission? Uh, if this is all about mission orientation, what is our mission? So um, fundamentally, as was mentioned by uh, Aaron actually earlier, um, our mission is to, is to grow and prosper in an uncertain world, fundamentally. Um, and a lot of those uncertainties and changes are coming from, a number, well, they're coming from a lot of sources. We have regulation, we have the growth of comp competition in places like uh, Korea. We have consumer expectations shifting enormously because of consumer electronics devices, the internet, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there are many, many things that are, uh, there are urban, urban, urbanization, congestion, uh, young people having a different view of mobility to, to, to older people. There's a, there's a lot of things that are changing in our, in our world, and fundamentally our mission is to continue to grow and, and prosper in that world. Um, we, like any uh, company, and in fact we've talked, we've talked a bit about, about, about governments as well, we, we have to think about where do we focus our, our innovation and, and what is that focus of innovation based on, well, it's firstly based on the first slide, on addressing the, uh, addressing the global issues, but also we have our, our, our company position, which is the, the triangle, I don't ask you to read all this at the moment, but we have, a, we have a mission as a company, which is to create experiences that customers uh, love for life, and then we have a, a lot of stuff that underpins that. We have two global iconic brands which we have to support in terms of how they appeal to customers, both on a practical and emotional uh, level. Uh, and uh, well, that brings us down to uh, a number of key areas for product, in for product innov innovation that we call desirable, connected, smart, clean, and, ca and, ca and capable. Uh, actually, I, it wasn't until I realized where we were going to be having this discussion that I, I, I was going to gloss over the desirable bit um, uh, for reasons that will become apparent uh, in a moment. But actually, uh, design is... Uh, is one of the key areas that we that we look at, and the key and one of the key areas that uh, is a, an area for, uh, for for innovation, particularly where design and technology come together to uh, to complement to complement each other. But um, what I'm trying to say on this slide, though, is is that when, when you take that com that company view of what we're trying what we're trying to do, uh, and then you look at where that has um, synergies, and we've heard this a couple of times from other speakers. Where, does, where do those, ha where do we have synergies with the societal challenges? Yeah, stuff that that, that governments are interested in in, uh, in investing in uh, as well. And in the auto industry, it's really around the whole the clean agenda, CO2 re CO2 reduction, um, and you can see the the main the main things that we that we're interested in there. But it's all but it's also around. The smart and connected agenda as well, future future mobility, um, and there's a few things that really help in this handshake between uh, between government and, and, and private. One is, you see this funny petal-shaped thing on the slide here. This is the agreed sort of consensus priority areas for the UK automotive industry as a whole. So, so not only have we got Jaguar Land, some, some commonality between what Jaguar Land Rover see as the key, the key key areas of innovation of the future. That's also common with the other auto industry uh, uh, players, and and it's also common with the um, with the societal challenges. So suddenly you get a you get a lock then um, uh, around around these these technologies which are which are of common interest to uh, to all of us. 
So if I go back to, to, to Jaguar Land Rover Land for, 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 the, mo for the moment, um, we've talked, uh, we've heard a bit about D and R and R and R and R and R and R and D. The auto industry is a very uh, D intensive business. Um, uh, we spend typically uh, two years uh, on a product program uh, just on the integration, validation, and industrialization of a, of, a, of a product. And we spend, actually it's now billions, um, just what well, we spend every penny we, we, uh, we, we earn pretty much on, on new product creation. And we spend billions in this, in this D, D area. And that's characterized by, as I say, about two years in terms of major investment. Uh, and then I've got this sort of curious technology readiness level thing up there. For, so those of you who know what TRLs are, fine. For those of you who don't, it's basically a scale that goes from one to nine where one is an idea in the bath and nine is something that's running down a production line. Um, but you can also see then that, 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 that um, uh, there's something curious here in the sense that you're two, years, you're two years out, you're investing billions, but actually from a new technology point of view, um, any new technology that comes into this system as you see it here has to be at technology readiness level seven. I, it has to be pretty... <coughs> Pretty mature. If it's disrupt, if it's disruptive, it's got to be pretty mature because that that de-intensive bubble there is very um, risk. Of, it's very intolerant to technical risk. If you put something in there that is that fails, you could take bring a whole car program down, uh, and and that's not the kind of failure that gets rewarded in in uh, in, in companies such as ours. There is failure that could, that's tolerated, but but not when you're not not when you're doing that. So. So that's really why um, we have to have um, uh, what pe some people have referred to it as a skunk works uh, here. It's not really a skunk work. It's, a, it's an innovation uh, and de-risking function within, 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 the, com within the company. Uh, and, we, uh, and there are still pressures, around, financial pressures around that because we're spending tens of millions over here. Uh, and there are some people that argue that, well, why don't you just take those tens of millions and put it into the big D and do another product program, uh, sell you know a, a new an additional product line, sell the socks off it in Southeast Asia or whatever, see your see your money again in a couple of years' time. Well, because of the mission that we that, that we that we specified earlier, i.e., to grow and prosper in the future, we know that you won't do that if you if you take your corporate R lab and you stick it and you stick the money in the in the in the in the D. In the auto industry, that you'll, it's just a recipe for a slow uh, but certain decline. So, so that's where, so, so, so that's where we um, uh, we do a lot of the innovation um, uh, on those on those on those uh, subjects that I've talked about, uh, and certainly for on the smart, connected, and clean, we do that in in cooperation with uh, with other uh, with other entities. So, if I fill in this um, uh, fill in this this map now. Um, we work with universities, we work with SMEs uh, and, uh, and new technology companies and perhaps the, the R departments of some of, our, some of our tier ones on that smart, connected and clean uh, uh, um, ad agenda. But there's some interesting things uh, that pop out from this chart that, 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 that talk to some of the themes that we've, that we've discussed earlier. For example, if you take the, that bit that's got the SME um, new technology sort of bit in there, the, the, uh, the, the seven years out, five years out, technology readiness level four. Actually, n new tech companies, even when they get involved with, with, with OEMs such as ourselves, they're at that first point of contact, they are at least seven years out, at least seven years from seeing their money again. And, uh, you know, and that's hard when you're trying to, when you're trying to finance those kind, those, those kind, of, those kind of companies. Um, you know, not many, many of the companies don't actually know they're seven years out, and certainly the people that finance them don't know they're seven years out. Okay. So, to try and bring all this together, because I'm getting the, getting the wind-up uh, um, uh, signal, um, what do we need to do, then, between industry and, and government? We've talked a lot about, uh, about placing large, the, the government uh, and the state placing large bets, particularly in the early stage uh, um, uh, science base, and we believe that that is absolutely necessary, um, but it has to be in the brackets. So it says an intelligent strategic portfolio, something that plays to the to the strengths of your your your, com your country, or something that your country strategically wants to wants to wants to get into. You need to incentivize collaboration and technolog technological de-risking in this space here, and this is where the UK Technology Strategy Board uh, 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 comes in. And we know, going back to what was said in the earlier session. 
that, uh, and what Vince Cable said last night as well, is that we are still on the linear part of that in terms of uh, knowing that if we invest more in, in, in that kind of uh, uh, collaboration that we will get, we will get more. It's not, it's, not peak, it's not peaked out there and the evidence is there to, to, to show it. And going back to what industry will do, you know, what, 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 are, what, are, what are you guys doing? Well, industry co-invests in the innovation and then invests in the detail, product development, validation and industrialization and investing the billions of pounds that are required to take this stuff to market. And assuming we all agree that jobs, export, huge economic activity is a good thing uh, uh, and, and this whole chain um, enables, enables that to, uh, to, to happen. Um, we are, in a, as a country in the UK, we're competing um, on, on this slide, if you like, with the likes of Germany, Korea and Japan uh, in, in particular. And the better that this is coordinated, the better that it's funded, but, but just before the, the, it, it, pla it plateaus, um, that then, the more, then the stronger the, uh, the economy and industry is likely to be. Uh, this is a slide I'm going I'm to skip over. It's actually an example. Ian Gray referred to stuff we're doing together uh, earlier. That's the, that's, the, that's the example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, we've, uh, Mariana informs me we've got exactly 10 minutes for questions. So in the interest of efficiency, could, I think we'll just take questions one by one rather than agglomerate them. Could we have quick, brief questions directed at a particular member of the panel? Um, the gentleman there raised his hand first. Uh, you, there's a mic just coming. The chief engineer of Google, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, produced the uh, law of arc accelerating returns, which he has def uh, defended. And according to, to him, innovation and technology is growing at an exponential rate and uh, no war, no recession has done that, that curve. Now, I think we've got to a point where the, the kind of chain described by Anthony uh, is under attack. And I wonder if uh, the uh, uh, mission-oriented finance uh, and the uh, uh, mission-oriented innovation and technology are crucial in order to maintain this and if you see that if this, your, your, your last uh, uh, picture doesn't happen, that uh, accelerating or that law will uh, be, uh, or will collapse. I mean, is that, how crucial do you think mission oriented finance is for maintaining that uh, 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 growth in technology? Okay. Um, I, I think that we need to answer that in the, in the perspective of the, the, the fact that the UK is, is in competition with, um, with the United States, in competition with, with, with South Korea, with Japan, Ger Germany, from an automotive industry perspective. And I think it's a very similar picture in, in aerospace and a number of other, another number of other um, industries as well. So I, I, I believe that, that, that actually if, if, that, if that disappeared, it would be not only be a, not only would um, uh, effectively what would happen is those R&D those R dollars or, or pounds in the UK would go hunt, hunting else, else, elsewhere for, for, a, for, for fertile ground um, for innovation to occur. Um, uh, but but also um, the, the 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 state would 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 lose as well because the, the state kind of wants it want, it want, it wants we've, we've heard as well about this all being a two way thing that, that that industrial activity such as we described stimulates the um, the research base uh, it also it stimulates another a number of other players in the territory which you're op operating in so to, to try and cut a long story short I think two things would happen in a particular territory one is the R&D of which I spoke would go hunting globally for the best place to go land where mission-oriented um, uh, innovation does take place. And then secondly, uh, actually the research base of the, of, the, of the country where you took it away from would also um, uh, diminish because it isn't being stimulated by, by, the, by the mission of large companies. Thank you. I think okay. that's definitely a yes. Uh, okay. so, um, <laughs> no, no, no. It was a good yes. It was an informative uh, yes. Um, uh, you said that uh, BMDS invested 200 million for 15% stake. So that valued you at sort of two years old at more than a billion, which is quite a rare sort of occurrence, even in a world of unicorns, as the valley describes it. How did that conversation go? Because that's that's not very common. I don't think. 
Uh, what do you mean the conversation? Sorry. Uh, the conversation with BNDS to say we're a two-year-old company without a product effectively, but with an idea we should be valued at more than a billion dollars. Why did they accept that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, before that, uh, we had uh, committed to the company um, $500 million of our own uh, in uh, guaranteed debt and direct equity. So it's not just $200 million. And the way we negotiated that uh, uh, was, I think, very smart from the side of BNDS because we created a mechanism that would guarantee for BNDS a minimum return. And uh, there is an upside as the company values more. So there, is a, there was a nine-month kind of discussion on a business plan, and we have milestones and triggers to deploy and happen if uh, the investment happen, if those such milestones are, are accomplished. I also think that one of the uh, principles is that uh, the, the concept of, uh, I cannot speak from, for BNDS, but the concepts that we've been um, uh, seeing is that uh, the entrepreneurial capital team of um, uh, BNDS has a, an expertise on really coming down on from compliance and, and guaranteeing how this um, investment is uh, promoting companies that can be disruptive. So they get into the details on how to be different from others or different from plain vanilla on bringing entire value chains into place. So in addition to the social, they also the development of value chains that I think they incorporated and made us also help development. Uh, the lady there in the third row. Oh, Isabella, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. The, the colleague there. We're, we're in different offices. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is a question to Bill. Um, it sounds to me like what you're saying in a way is that maybe monopolies can be a good thing sometimes, whether that's um, a government monopoly or a corporate monopoly, and it really depends on the personality of the person at the helm of that monopoly, which uh, takes me into sort of ancient history territory, which is my kind of specialist um, subject, and, and Game of Thrones territory, really. Um, and on that basis, have you heard, because have you heard of this idea that is going around the internet, that maybe what we should do is just dissolve the government and replace um, the president with, with Eric Schmidt as CEO of America. <laughs> so that's, that's my question. Uh, well, I, I hadn't heard that, but then I, maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. But um, yeah, no, I think that the you know, so-called monopoly is nothing new. Uh, and uh, uh, we used to, at least in the United States, used to, and as well as other places, regulate them and say, okay, you, know, you have established this position. Uh, we're dependent on you. Uh, you are dependent on us. And, uh, here, here's how it's going to play out. Now, uh, sometimes it was done in a way that was, uh, and often, behind closed doors. I can give you lots of examples of that, uh, let's say, from the airline industry in the United States, et cetera. And I think there's always been a tendency in the United States, uh, knowing that case best, for uh, business, to, business interest to get the upper hand in, in this, partly because of the ideology that the state isn't involved and, be, and because it's often done. Uh, the deals are often made behind closed doors. Uh, so you have to open that up. Um, but uh, you have to recognize that uh, there are going to be, uh, particularly with network externalities and things like this, that uh, companies that are, are going to be dominant, and once they're dominant, nobody else is going to enter. And they have to be regulated. And some of the, the value that they're capturing has to go back to where it came from. And, you know, Facebook is is, is a, a, a massive example of that, uh, where it, it, the value has been allowed to be captured by, in, by too small a group of people. And um, yeah, so I, uh, what, I'm ask, uh, what I'm arguing for is a, is, a, is, a, is a discussion about this, if the solution is to make uh, 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 the CEO of the, the biggest, strongest companies, uh, in fact, the people who are governing the country and, and, and turn uh, reality into, uh, you know, uh, practical reality into political reality, well, maybe that would be, that's a good way to have the discussion. Uh, but that, in fact, you know, I pointed out there, that is the reality with Google. I mean, it's two people who, uh, who maybe Schmidt as well, who, who are deciding what this, one of the most powerful companies in the world is, is going to do in the future, and nobody else has much of a say about that. 
Uh, uh, now, I see two minutes on the clock and three hands in the air, so I'm going to reverse it and get all three questions, that gentleman there, that gentleman there, and the lady sitting just next to him. If you could ask all three one in a row and be very efficient in your... And Bill, just wait for it. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, you uh, seem to represent the real leading companies in the field of innovation. I'm wondering how much support you're prepared to give to the educational sector, because uh, you know all this innovation is wonderful, but without without engaging the the broader societal spheres and education specifically, it's it's got the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Anthony Harper. Can you find the staff you need in research? And has the profile of applicants changed since the financial crisis? Good question. Tony, start with you. Um, OK, uh, so the, the two were kind of related, I think. One is, what, what are we prepared to do for the, the supporting the education sector? Um, I mean, I haven't got a long list of, of stuff we are doing, but, but, there's, but there, there's an awful lot that we are investing as a company in the educational uh, um, uh, sector, all the way from uh, from technical apprentices all the way through to postgrads, we, we, we invest and we support that, um, uh, all, all of that, mainly because we know, we know that our future is uh, really dependent upon the people uh, uh, that, we, that we get and, uh, uh, and being able to continue to, uh, to, to recruit. The, 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 the short answer to the question, can you get the people, uh, is actually at the moment, yes, in my function. However, we know that we are robbing other parts of the ecosystem because we're sat at the, we're sat at the top of the food chain. You know, we're a great company. Um, we, 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 we make we, we, we you know we're, we're, we're prosperous. We're a secure employer, uh, and that's a, that's attract that's attractive. So if you, if you just look at the people that we recruit, that's fine. But then you have to look at the the, the wider system, our suppliers, um, all those all those bubbles that were halfway across the chart. Um, can they get the people they need to help support to help support the whole system? And that that's the big issue. Um. Bill. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Well, I think once you start getting into, you know, who the shareholders are, uh, really the way it needs to be broken down is what are the shareholders doing there? So it's really not institutional investors as institutional investors. It's institutional investors as uh, funds that are, in most cases, or in many cases, uh, supporting people's retirement. Uh, so there needs to be a discussion there about how, how uh, if you're going to put money into uh, securities of companies, uh, what is the balance there between supporting people's entire retirement and what you get out? Uh, and in the end, at least in the United States, it's worked out very badly, actually, for people, uh, people's retirement. Uh, there's a whole other group of people who, who then came in on top of that structure, and that's the head fund activists, and they're the ones who are, who are raking in the money, you know, uh, uh, whether, whether the market goes up or down. Uh, and one of the things I like to say is that in the, in the 1980s, uh, you had this notion of hostile takeovers. That somehow, you know, if uh, you're coming in from the outside, management want to protect the company. No one talks about hostile takeovers anymore because uh, the hedge fund activists and, and, and the top executives are in, in bed with each other. And basically, the, the big investment bank, Goldman Sachs, and the other. They're just trying to get higher returns out of the economy. Uh, and... Uh, we can see that in you know things that Thomas Piketty has, has documented, and you know the, the concentration income at the top. Uh, so it has to you have to break down really what those shareholders are doing there, what they're trying to get out of it. They're not trying to run the companies; uh, they're trying to get a return out of the value that's created in the economy. And I think we need to regulate that process so that it's in fact sustainable. Bill, I have a gun at my head for five past one, seven past one. Panadi, would you like the last word on on, on education? Thank you. Uh, I think. Um, Stanislaw's uh, uh, question uh, a little bit at least. In our, in our case, we integrate the entire value chain. So uh, yes, education is, is very important to us and we have to support kind of the, the environments where we're inserted uh, with education that goes from educating operators in remote areas so that they can operate uh, um, machines and, and harvesting and, and last generation machines. 
and also to stimulate uh, young scientists and researchers to, to, to come for a company that's only three years old and uh, basically compete uh, for talents uh, with these uh, huge companies. And the way we do that is uh, to bring a sense of purpose, the missionary sense of purpose, and give autonomy for them not only to bring their education but to diversify and uh, develop education within uh, our own needs. Well, thank you to all three of you and to Aaron, uh, who left earlier, for a really, really educational um, session. Thank you.